physical science students. Um, we're back for another video talking about chemical bonds. Uh, today we're going to be talking about how you determine which type of bonds are in certain compounds. Um, and then after that we're going to do some practice on drawing covalent Lewis dot structures. Um, it does get a little bit more complex than just doing single atom Lewis dot structures. Uh, so we'll get into how those bonds. You'll have two assignments this week uh, talking about ionic bonding and uh, some of these covalent Lewis dot structures so make sure you get those done as soon as possible and as always if you have questions make sure that you contact me or pop into office hours and we'll get those taken care of hey without further ado let's get right into this video all right so just a reminder on ionic and covalent bonding remember that ionic bonding is when one atom is giving away electrons to another atom um, in order to for both atoms to have stable outer shells meaning that they have full octets okay so if you, if an atom has one uh, valence electron that it's trying to get rid of and then there's another atom that wants to that has seven valence electrons and wants to gain one to fill its octet those two things will bond because one wants to give it away and the other one wants to accept it uh, covalent bonds are when they are shared by two or more atoms um, basically by sharing they are mutually using those electrons to fill their outer shells um, and make sure that they fill or have those octet rules satisfied okay so the technical way that you figure out if you have an ionic or covalent bond is using electronegativity values so when you take an atom and bond it to another atom if you subtract the two electronegativity values and it falls between a 1.7 and a 4.0 that is an ionic compound that is an ionic bond if it falls between 0.4 and 1.7 that is going to be a polar covalent bond okay and then finally if it falls between 0 and 0.4 that's a non-polar covalent bond just as a reminder electronegativity was one of our periodic trends it is the atom's ability to attract electrons in a chemical bond now the good thing about us being online is that you guys can easily look up electronegativity values. Um, if you need to know oxygen's electronegativity value, you can simply just Google oxygen's electronegativity value and it'll spit you out a number. Hey, okay, now this isn't always um, handy, so there is an easier way that I'm going to talk about on the next slide. Hey, the easy way to do these. Um, and notice that I added in a metallic bond here. We don't really talk about metallic bonds that often, but you do need to know it for your test. So make sure that you understand that a metallic bond is when a metal bonds to another metal. Okay, that is all that we've described for metallic bonds. We'll talk about some of their properties here later when we talk about the properties of all these bonds. Um, but the other thing you need to know is that for ionic bonds, you take non-metals bonded to metals. Okay, you'll see on my periodic table that the blue color are the metals and the green color are the non-metals. So whenever you have something tends to be on the left side of the periodic, periodic table bonded with something on the right side of the periodic table, that's when you get ionic bonds. Okay, and then covalent bonds only happen when you bond non-metals to other non-metals. So that would be a green to a green. So for, excuse me, for example, uh, H2O hydrogen bonding to oxygen that's two nonmetals that is going to give you a covalent bond now remember that there's two different kinds of covalent bonds which we're going to talk about in our next slide okay polar covalent and nonpolar covalent po polar covalent having to do with the fact that the electrons are shared but one atom is much more electronegatively charged meaning that it attracts the electrons closer to it so the electrons spend much more time surrounding it nonpolar is when they are shared perfectly equal um, and that not one atom is dominating the pull of the electrons one way or the other okay an example of this again is high or uh, water h2o um, another one is hydroxide so in this case I just have one oxygen and one hydrogen so I take the electronegativity of oxygen which is 3.5 and I take the electronegativity of hydrogen which is 2.1 and 
When you subtract those, you get 1.4. And if you go back to my other slides, then it talks about that polar covalent is between 0.4 and 1.7. 1.4 fits right in between there, so we know that this would be a polar covalent bond. All right, so now we're going to get into what I consider to be one of the more difficult things to do in our chemistry class. And I'm going to try to do this as best as possible. Hopefully my pen works uh, well. Um, but we're going to get into how to draw these uh, covalent molecules with Lewis dot structures. Remember, Lewis dot structures are the ones that have the valence electrons as dots around the chemical symbol. This is going to be similar, but we're actually going to show the bonds in there as well. So CF4, which is carbon tetrafluoride. We'll get into naming here in a little bit as well, but that is for a future video. So let's just get into this for right now. So the first thing we need to do is find the total number of valence electrons. You can do that either by simply looking up how many valence electrons each of these have, or if you remember that the group number can tell you how many valence electrons there are, um, you can use that as well. So for example, carbon, the group that it's in has four valence electrons. So let me see if I can get my pen to write. So carbon has four valence electrons. Okay, fluorine is in the halogens. They have seven. Okay, now make sure I have four fluorines here. So I'm going to have to multiply that by four. And so that really has 28. So then that makes a total of 28 plus four, which is. 32. Okay, so I know that I need to place 32 valence electrons on my Lewis dot structure. So then what I move to is writing the symbol for the single atom, single atom surrounded by all the other atoms. So the only single atom here is carbon. Okay, and it needs to be surrounded by all the fluorines. Now, by surrounded, we only mean there's four locations above below to the left and to the right don't put something off to the left or off to the right okay if you get into more complex <coughs> excuse me into more complex chemistry classes they will tell you more or teach you more about the shape of these atoms but for the our purposes we're just going to keep it above below left and right so i'm going to place a fluorine up here a fluorine over here fluorine over here Fluorine over there. Um, I'm going to move this one because I need to have a little bit of space. So I'll just make it smaller. Okay, so I placed them all around. Okay, one thing else I want to mention is if there is not a single atom, there are other methods to figuring out which atoms will be in the center of your Lewis dot structure. So make sure you jot those down real quick. All right, connect all the molecules by a single bond. Single, 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 and single. Okay, now what you have to make sure that you understand is all these lines mean that there are two electrons in that line. One from carbon and one from fluorine. Okay, so each line here represents two electrons. So right now there are eight electrons around my carbon atom. And so what I do is I take my total, 32, and I have used eight valence electrons, leaving me with 24 to place. Hey, and so what I do after that is I just start placing uh, my, so I start placing my valence electrons to make sure that everybody has an eight in their outer shell. So what I do here, notice that this top fluorine only has two because it has one bond to carbon. So that represents two. So it needs six more to be full. One, two, three, four, five, six. If I take the six that I just placed away from 24, I get 18. I'm gonna place six more on this fluorine because it only has two and it needs eight. I take six more away because that I just placed. I'm gonna go over here because I'm running into my face. Um, and let's see, 18 minus 6 is 12. 
I put six around this bottom one. And then finally I have my last six and I place those around flooring. Okay, this image is what we're looking for for our Lewis dot structures for covalent molecules. Okay, notice again that I'm saying this for covalent molecules. These are the only ones that have Lewis dot structures like this because they're the only ones that share electrons. Remember, ionics don't share electrons, so we don't write them like this. Okay. <coughs> Every once in a while, you will come across things that have double and triple bonds. Everything you need to know is that every time you write another line, that is taking away two more valence electrons. Okay, so if I double bond to fluorine, that would be adding two more, which carbon can't do because it already has a full eight. That's why I can't double bond anything. Okay, and so if you count them all up, every single one of my atoms has eight outer electrons, and that is the goal of drawing these covalent molecules. Now, by no means do I think that you are an expert right now, so we're going to do again some more examples of how this works. All right, so let's talk about water. Okay, so water here, if I get my pen, let's see if my pen works, is H2O. Okay, and so if you remember, I need to calculate my valence electrons first. So hydrogen has one, okay, but I have two of them, so that's times two, which equals two. Oxygen has six, okay, so plus six for a total of eight. Perfect, so I have eight valence electrons that I need to place. So what I'm going to do is, again, I take the single, the single atom and put it in the middle. So that's going to be oxygen, because notice that I have two hydrogen. Oxygen there. Okay. Now I have hydrogen and hydrogen over here. And I'm going to make single bonds. Okay. Now, in this case... Each line represents two electrons, so two there and two there means I already placed four of my eight, leaving me with four more to place. Okay. Now, remember that hydrogen is kind of a special case because it doesn't, it's not very big. It doesn't have eight, it doesn't want eight electrons in its outer shell. It only wants two. That's the duet rule versus the octet rule for everything else. And so instead, we're going to leave those because each of them has two. Notice that this line attached to hydrogen means that it has two electrons there. This line connected to the other hydrogen means that it has two lines there. So I need to place these four around oxygen above and below here. And if you count them up, now oxygen has a full eight in its outer shell and I'm left with no more valence electrons, and this would be my final answer. Okay. Again, if you need to count them up, do it. Hydrogen has two, other hydrogen has two, oxygen has two, four, six, and eight, and I am done. All right, we're gonna do one more example. So we have N2 here, nitrogen two. Okay, so nitrogen, Hey, I'm going to have to double check. I'm going to have to look at my periodic table. All right, let's look at our periodic table. And they say that it has five valence electrons, but I have two of them. So that makes a total of 10 valence electrons to place. Okay, so notice that I don't really have a single atom here, so I'm just going to simply put an N connected to another N, okay, because I have to have two of them. Okay, when I do that, 
I've got eight more to place. It, here is where the tricky part comes. It's kind of like a puzzle. Okay, you can try certain things out, but remember again, I need this to have eight valence electrons for both nitrogens in order for this to work. Otherwise, these two things wouldn't bond to each other in the first place. Okay, so think to yourself, how can I use eight more valence electrons to get these two things to have eight in their outer shells? Okay. So what ends up happening is if I place these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, okay, notice that I don't have a full outer shell. Okay, if the nitrogen on the left has two, four, six. The nitrogen on the right has two, four, six. Okay, so this isn't gonna work. I'm gonna have to do something else. And so what I do instead, okay, is I'm going to add another bond. Okay, and so now, if you count them up, okay, um, let me see how many, I'm going to erase these ones and these ones. Okay, so then I subtract another two. Now I'm down to four to place. Okay, so if you notice, both nitrogens now have four valence electrons. Remember, each line is worth two. Okay, if it's connected to a nitrogen, it gets both of them. Okay, so nitro the nitrogen on the right has four, the nitrogen on, <laughs> on the left has four. Okay. And so if I go and I place my remaining four valence electrons here, I'm still not satisfied. Okay, so one, two, three, four, I'm out of valence electrons. Okay, nitrogen on the left still has six, nitrogen on the right still has six. That's not going to work. Okay, and so what I do is I add another bond. Okay, now I have a triple bond. I use two more. Uh, two. Okay, I just realized that I made a mistake with my math. Hopefully you guys noticed it too. I'm going to erase it here real quick. I said 8 minus 2 was 4 when it's actually 6. Okay, so let me go fix that because that's going to help us out here. Okay, so I actually have 4... Uh, valence electrons remaining okay right now this nitrogen has six this nitrogen has six okay a triple bond really means that each of those atoms are going to have six valence electrons so i have four more to place and then if i place two on this side and two on this side now each of them has eight exactly like i want Okay, so you got to get kind of creative sometimes with your bonds and if you can't get it to work out by just placing all your valence electrons then you need to start looking into double bonds and triple bonds and that sort of thing okay but again remember that the process always has you start with single ones and then move on from there okay the last thing that you guys need to talk about are writing ionic compounds. And I'm hoping, hoping that these are really easy. They're not meant to be very difficult. Okay, so remember, first of all, that ionic compounds are between a metal and a non-metal. Here, everything on the left is a metal. Everything on the right is a non-metal. Okay, um, and basically all we're going to do here is talk about the charges. So... For example, sodium okay, has one valence electron. Okay, chlorine wants one valence electron because it has seven. So what ends up happening, okay, you make these brackets 
and it's going to have your two elements in there. And the only thing that you guys need to add are, first of all, that, let me hold my screen, chlorine is going to be the thing that gets a full outer shell. Okay, and the, if you notice on here, we need to make sure we always write the charges. So if chlorine gains an electron, it is now going to have a one minus charge. Pretend that's a one minus. I'm going to erase that. That looks terrible. One minus, which means that sodium has a one plus because it gave away an electron. If you give away your negatives, you're going to be more positive. Okay? And that is all you guys have to do when you write these uh, ionic compounds. Okay? So let's try um, magnesium and fluorine here. Okay? Magnesium has two valence electrons. Uh, fluorine is also a halogen, so I believe it has seven. Let me just double check on my periodic table real quick. <laughs> yes, it is in the halogen, so it has a uh, seven in its um, outer ring. So we start here. Magnesium, and we start with fluorine. We fill its outer shell with eight. Now, notice that this one's going to have a little two down here. Okay, now because this fluorine has a two, okay. Remember that magnesium had two valence electrons to give away. So it needs to bond to two fluorines in order to give one to one fluorine and one to the other fluorine. And so what happens is that the charge on my, each of my fluorines is still a one minus because they each gain one. And the charge on my magnesium is a two plus. Okay, it gives away its two electrons one to fluorine on the left, one to fluorine on the right, making their charge one minus. Okay, now, a lot of the time what they tell you um, as a quick trick is that you take the subscript of one and it becomes the charge of the other. And then let's just pretend there's one for magnesium here and that becomes the charge for the fluorine. Okay, <coughs> the metals will always have positive charges and then the non-metals will always have negative charges. Make sure that you always keep that constant as well. Okay, using that same logic, we have potassium and we have oxygen. Remember again to put in your valence electrons. Okay, and we have two of those. Okay. Um, I put the two on the wrong thing. We have two potassiums, not two oxygens. Okay, so potassium has one valence electron. So what it's going to do, oxygen needs two because it has six. Okay, so I need two, pat, two potassiums to each give up one valence electron to oxygen to make it have eight in its outer shell. And so when it gains those two electrons, its charge is going to be two minus. And each of my potassiums give away one electron, so their charge is going to be one plus. Okay, guys, that is it for everything I need you to know for your assignments. Again, if you have any questions, let me know. Come into office hours, email me, direct message me, whatever it takes. Um, I'm here for you. All right, thanks for watching.